Hello and welcome back to the channel, and if it's your first time here, hey, how you doing? And why'd it take you so long to get here? If you're wondering why my nails are painted, it's because my parents went on vacation, and you know what they say, when the parents are away, the self-expression can finally play. <laughs> it sure is, buddy. As a kid, without a doubt, my favorite toy was Thomas the Tank Engine. And yeah, you could say, I, I like, like trains. trains. But Thomas the Tank Engine was a wildly successful toy brand long before my parents forgot to wear protection. The idea of Thomas the Tank Engine was conceived in 1942, and his inaugural book was released in 1945. Although it wouldn't be until 1957 that Thomas would enter the realm of extraordinarily marketable children's toys. It started as simple cardboard cutouts and evolved into a whole smorgasbord of die-cast train models that most people are probably used to. Thomas would then make his way onto British television media, as most trains do, on the ITV television network. The series would go on to air for 37 years from 1984 until only a few years ago in 2021. The show would also undergo a few rebrands from time to time, but it was always the same series being produced by the same company, even if the network changed. But during the TV show's air, a new version of the show came out. It wasn't a replacement for the show, nor was it an entirely different version of the show. It was called Shining Time Station. It was a show that incorporated bits and pieces of the animated TV show and combined them with newly recorded live action segments. It aired from 1989 to 1996 and was wildly successful at the time, but it stopped making new episodes a few seasons before the mainline show rebranded in season 7. This is entirely unrelated, but the name of the last episode of Shining Time Station is Paint the Town Red, and Doja Cat was born a year before this. I don't know, it doesn't sound like a coincidence to me. But the legacy of the show would live on in the form of Thomas and the Magic Railroad, a live action Thomas the Tank Engine movie that began production in 1995 and was released on July 14th, 2000 in the United Kingdom and July 26th in the United States. Supposedly, some of the lore from Shining Time Station is moderately important to understand the movie to its fullest, but you have got me astronomically f***ed up if you think I'm gonna watch a single episode of this show so that I can better understand a Thomas the Tank Engine movie. Shake! As far as I'm concerned, this show is one big filler episode. Now, with all that I've told you about how wildly popular and successful this franchise was, you're probably sitting there anxiously waiting for me to tell you that this movie made any money at all and got generally positive reviews. Well, my parents are going to be the only people who are disappointed in me when they watch this video because this movie bombed harder than Barack Obama in 2016 and was received worse than a T-Mobile cell phone in Nebraska. The movie only made $19.7 million against a budget of 19 million dollars. And this is supposedly before advertising. Because this movie only made $700,000, it's entirely possible to assume that they didn't market the movie at all, assuming that the Thomas brand had enough notoriety to carry the movie to success. The movie did re-release in 2020 for its 20th anniversary, but I don't even think those numbers are worth mentioning. Of course, this is an extremely truncated version of the Thomas the Tank Engine lore. If you want to know more about that, Wikipedia is free. I'm here to make a video about a movie because my therapist suggested that it would stop me from having night terrors. It's either that or giving up the insane amount of DMT that I ingest, but there are some hobbies you just can't give up. This entire movie is narrated by Alec Baldwin, which I guess is a bit of an odd choice, but it'll be important later, so we'll come back to that. In the first moment, we're introduced to the titular Thomas the Tank Engine, voiced by Edward Glenn. And when I say voiced, I mean that in like the most generic way possible. Because the thing about the voices of the trains in this movie is that the trains' mouths don't move like ever. They change faceplates whenever they make one of eight expressions, but they never physically talk. This is probably due to budget constraints, but truthfully, this was perhaps for the best. I don't think that we'd like to look at these guys' faces if they were fully animated with early 2000s CGI. So this decision is kind of the lesser of two evils. The first character that Thomas has an interaction with is Gordon, who is voiced by Neil Crone. Gordon is a bit stuck up, but I f with him heavy because he's a little bit fruity. Though Thomas and Gordon's conversation is cut a bit short when Diesel blasts through the middle of the track. Diesel f***ing sucks. Don't be a Diesel. I don't know how many of you guys actually saw Bullet Train, but Lemon was not lying when he described Diesel. Some people are Diesels, f***ing me. That was the trouble. I mean, even Thomas goes as far as to describe him in the most canned way possible for me. The blast from the past, 
who hates steam engines. By the way, Diesel is also voiced by Neil Crone. I'm not a railway conductor, so I may just be stupid when I say this, but is it not weird that there are three different railways here and all three of them are going in the same direction? Thomas and Gordon are both at passenger stop, so they should be going in opposite directions for sure, right? But enough about talking trains and all that nonsense. Let's go back to the real world and visit the wonderful city of Shining Time. Shining Time is a beautiful town with normal people, where nothing weird ever- Okay, what the actual f During this annoyingly long series of establishing shots, we also get blessed with an original song called Shining Time. If you guessed that the song is about Shining Time, you'd be correct. This is James voiced by Susan Roman. James was by far my favorite of the bunch as a kid because he's red and I really liked the number five. And that's pretty much the extent of his personality. He's red and he has the number five. But also they gave him a female voice actor and that makes him sound like a twink or like the dubbed version of Naruto. Both are acceptable references. Wait, can trains be twinks? If, if there's like a twink rule book that someone could send me, I'd very much appreciate it. Out of nowhere in this scene, Diesel shows up and begins telling Thomas and James about his heinous plans. I mean, he is a train, so it's not like he's got anything better to do? Diesel plans to find and destroy the lost steam engine and then dominate all other steam engines. Yeah, it shouldn't be hard to dominate James. God, I really hope these trains aren't miners. Can you imagine if my career ends because I called this guy a twink? Because sexualizing James the tank engine would be a wild thing to lose my career over. But why does Diesel need to destroy some random unaffiliated steam engine for this? The bitch is already at a commission anyway, just skip to the part where you commit homicide. Back in reality, we're introduced to two more characters. This is Patch, played by Cody McClain's. He's, uh, I don't know, he's 12? They wrote his character, and then I think they forgot to make him interesting or give him a personality, so I genuinely have nothing to say about him. The other character is Billy Two Feathers, played by Russell Means. You can tell he was written by a white guy because the actual Native American who plays him has a normal ass name, but they had to give his character some native flair to it. Also, he has the same first name as the Native American guy from Twilight. It's not enough to be a pattern yet, but I will be looking out for it from now on. Our next character in line is Burnett Stone, played by Peter Fonda. He's kind of depressing. Even the other characters in the movie said that he used to be happy, but just isn't anymore. If I had to take a guess, it's probably because he also watched the Zombies trilogy. We really need to start a support group. Burnett is the caretaker of this train, who we're told is vital to the magic that holds Sodor and Shining Time together. Burnett explains that Lady is kept in this cave because years ago she was being chased around and was nearly destroyed by an evil Diesel. He managed to get her away, but she broke down in the process. Why is this movie treating Diesel fuel like it's the f***ing black? plague. Even Thomas says that he'll be happy when diesel trains end up being obsolete, and our main antagonist is a diesel engine. Like yeah sure this diesel in particular is a dick, but aren't there other real living creatures? people, living train diesels that are just kind of generally acceptable people? Speaking of generally acceptable diesel engines, these two are Splatter and Dodge, voiced by Neil Crone, again, and Kevin Frank, respectively. They're diesel's henchmen who are reluctantly tasked with finding the lost steam engine. They're not nearly as vile as diesel, but they do whatever he says because he's mean and has a big meaty claw. This is where we get our first formal introduction to the conductor. He's, uh, uh, he's... He's kind of weird. The conductor is played by Alec Baldwin. Say what you want, but this was the real end of his career. The conductor is this weird magic being that exists because the movie needs him to. He's really short, and it's never explained why he's really short, but it is stated that he is normal size on Sodor. He's shorter in the real world though, even though he's not native to Sodor. In fact, this is his first day on Sodor. And no, this isn't bad CGI that's just a product of its time, the conductor's magic whistle isn't working right. Or in movie terms, something is wrong with his sparkle. This is where our next character, Lily, comes into the story. Lily is played by Mara Wilson and is the granddaughter of Burnett. She's an upbeat young girl who sees the magic in everything, such as the reflections of light on a rainy day. So basically she's that one really annoying person who finds the bright side to everything. I mean, yeah, sure, your mom might be dead, but hey, at least you don't have to split your T-Mobile data anymore so you can watch more YouTube at school. What the f*** is wrong with you? This made me laugh harder than anything has made me laugh in my entire life. James is a big engine, hmm? Mm. You, Thomas, are small. Small, 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 teeny, weeny, weeny. And I, I'm a big blue engine who knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> 
these trains are Toby, Henry, and Percy. Their characters aren't exactly important to the story, but it is noted that the rumor of the lost steam engine has now spread, and every train is on a mission to find it first. Not because the fate of the island depends on it or anything, they just all want bragging rights. Because vanity is not a trait that's limited to humans. When we go to catch up with the conductor, we find that he's made his way to Sir Topham Hatt's office. He finds a note explaining that Sir Topham Hatt and his family have left for vacation. Probably the single most important person on the island of Sodor, and you don't even have him in the movie? No wonder you got sh reviews. The conductor even gets a call from Sir Topham Hatt, but Sir Topham Hatt doesn't have a voice actor. He just grumbles like the adults in the Charlie Brown universe. That night, while everyone is sleeping, Diesel decides to f***ing jump the conductor, as well as all the sleeping trains. I may be misinterpreting this scene, but there are only two things he could have possibly come here to do. A, he could have either been explaining his malicious plans to the protagonist of the movie, which he did already, so that makes option B more likely. He came there for no other reason than to murder the conductor. Diesel makes it very obvious that he either wants the conductor to f*** off or die. But Diesel backs off when the conductor threatens him with a bag of sugar, saying he'll pour it down his tank which will cause him to seize up and become immobile forever. As horrifying as the thought of that may be, because essentially he is paralyzing someone, it wouldn't actually be permanent. So it would actually probably be a good idea to do that at this point. This guy literally just came for you in your sleep saying he was going to kill you. You're gonna want to get ahead of this now, especially since your sparkle isn't working. The next morning, the conductor heads out looking for a windmill. Supposedly it's to help him find the magic gold dust that he needs to get his sparkle back. Wait, so the sparkle isn't magic, it's, it's literally just gold? dust? I mean, like, it's clearly magic. It, it makes him teleport and shit, but it's powered by a, a physical object that he can run out of. So it's not like it stopped working for no reason. It stopped because you ran out of it. The conductor gets lost on his way to the windmill, but he finds these vegetables that were left behind by a rabbit that help him begin to think about what his next step is. You know what? Credit to the writers for somehow finding a way to tell children to eat their vegetables in a movie about talking trains. After eating enough carrots and celery, he gets the idea to call his cousin, Junior, played by Michael E. Rogers. Junior is an easygoing Scottish surfer bro whom the conductor enlists to help him get more gold dust. The conductor sends Junior to get his backup whistle from his office back in Shining Time, where Junior has a very short run-in with Lily. Nothing of actual importance is discussed in the scene, but I do want to take the time to note that Lily did hop on the wrong train, so instead of ending up on Muffle Mountain with her grandfather, she ended up in Shining Time. It is a little odd that she doesn't question what's going on here at all though. You just saw a 10 inch guy dissipate into gold dust after you got off on the wrong station and you don't even seem a little bit concerned. It ends up being fine though because Stacy ends up taking Lily to meet up with her grandfather anyway. That night, everyone ends up hearing ominous noises that we're told are the sound of ladies magic, but I don't care about that. I care about the fact that Lily sleeps like a f***ing maniac. If you sleep with two pillows like this, genuinely never f***ing talk to me. Also, you're gonna give yourself some serious spinal problems. That's not healthy. Don't do that. While the conductor is sleeping, we get all of these super depressing shots of Shining Time. I think he might be slightly overestimating his importance to Shining Time just a bit. This is what high schoolers who work retail think will happen after they quit. Percy and Thomas end up talking about a secret railway that might be where the lost engine is hidden, but Diesel overhears everything they say. So Toby goes to chase after Diesel and find out what he intends to do with this information, where we find out that he intends to have Splatter and Dodge find the secret railroad while Diesel goes to kill the conductor. Yes, I'm being 100% serious, he plans to kill the conductor. I know I said that before, but I was exaggerating, but he just straight up says that this time. If you're wondering why Diesel goes straight to murder, it's because he really doesn't like the conductor. That's, that's actually the reason, yes. Toby distracts the Diesel so he can give the steam engines a bit of a head start while everyone else goes back to work. Uh, are, are you serious? You think you have time to go back to your nine to five? Toby, Diesel has plans to murder someone, I think we can take a day off for once. While Thomas is collecting coal cars, one of the coal trucks takes a quick visit to the Shadow Realm without him even noticing. So Percy has to put it together for Thomas that those are the secret rails. So you're telling me, in the 20 years that Lady has been gone, not one person has ever been up against those buffers? I, I mean, we just saw Thomas attempt to use them, so it's not like those rails are never used. Regardless, Thomas tells Percy to protect those buffers from Diesel while Thomas goes to find the conductor. This introduces the scene that scared the f 
out of me as a kid. In this scene, Diesel finds the conductor, captures him, and holds him over a bridge, threatening to drop him to his death unless the conductor tells him where the magic rails are. Like, what? This is a kid's movie! But the conductor manages to cut one of the hydraulic lines to Diesel's claw, causing him to be flung thousands of feet away and to land at the windmill that he was looking for. He then quickly finds a clue that will lead him to more gold dust. We head back to the real world where Patch and Lily have become friends. They go exploring and Patch ends up taking Lily back to Shining Time where they run into Junior once again. Remember Junior? The guy they introduced 15 minutes ago? He was supposed to catch up with the conductor but never did. The reason he never caught up with the conductor is because he overslept. That in and of itself isn't a terrible excuse, but it's been a whole day. And why did he bother to sleep at all? He should have just grabbed the gold dust and went straight to catch up with the conductor. Bro just saw the conductor's 15 inch futon and couldn't help himself. All of that aside, something pretty stupid happens here. Junior asks if Lily wants to come along to Sodor with him. This guy isn't exactly a role model, so I'm not entirely surprised that he asked the question. The thing that annoys me is that to take Lily with him, he needs to use all of the gold dust and the extra supply that he was sent there to get in the first place. All to take a 12 year old girl that he just met to Sodor. And I want to blame Lily for going with this random man at all, but one, this is a movie, and two, this is a 12 year old girl. Children are just that stupid. They end up traveling down the Magic Railroad, and I'd like to note that Lily and Junior are the same size because Sodor is an island that adjusts people to fit the surroundings. So it's not entirely clear whether Lily shrank or if Junior grew. Honestly though, it's a detail that I can believe in. I think it works because it's not too contrived or complicated. Lily and Junior make their way up to this comically large hill and run into Thomas, who actually f***ing hates Junior because Junior continually pranks Thomas. Lily actually gets used to the fact that trains both talk and have faces pretty quickly, and they make their way off to the windmill where they find the conductor, who is reasonably pissed that it took Junior this long to get here. Really, nigga? Just for gits and shiggles, Junior decides to ride the windmill. However, the wind quickly picks up and he conveniently gets launched onto the top of Diesel. O or is that inconvenient? I, I guess it depends on whether or not you're a glass half full kind of guy. Like, you're not dead but you're probably about to be. But neither Junior nor the conductor seem upset about this turn of events, so it'll probably be convenient for the plot later. And who knows, maybe this sh happens to them all the time. Back in Shining Time, Patch also tells Burnett that Lily has gone missing, and Burnett doesn't seem too concerned either. Wow, the familial bonds in this movie are shockingly weak. During that night, Percy finds that Splatter and Dodge have found the Magic Railroad, and he goes off to warn Thomas before Diesel finds out and goes to commit vehicular train slaughter. Thomas takes Lily through the Magic Railroad so that they can find Burnett and the Lost Engine, and put the Lost Engine back on the railroad. I find it funny that they say that the railroad needs Lady and Lady needs the railroad. I mean, yeah, that's... that's how trains work. While heading through the railroad, Thomas stops for this coal truck. I'm not particularly sure how this works because they're on two different tracks. Wait, why does the Magic Railroad have two different tracks? Does one go to this random exit at Muffle Mountain and the other goes somewhere else entirely random like Gainesville, Florida? And how do they get the coal truck from the other track? Is Lily just f***ing shredded and she just lifted the coal car from one track to the other? After making it back to Shining Time, Lily runs off to go find her grandfather and promises to come back for Thomas, though he falls down the mountain before she can do as much. This sequence has a lot of annoyingly convenient moments, such as Lily running into Patch halfway down the mountain and Thomas is rolling into another random entrance for the Magic Railroad. Well, there goes my Thomas Goes to Florida fan fiction. <laughs> Lily reunites with her grandfather, and she tells him that they have special coal from Sodor waiting for Lady uh. at the top of the mountain, so Patch runs to go get some. At the same time as all of that, here's one of the other scenes that made me sh my pants as a kid. Diesel corners James and Junior in this coal refinery and gets ready to tear them both to shreds. But Junior has a tiny bit of gold dust left that he can use to get them both to safety. But this means that they're even more out of gold dust than they were before. I wasn't lying or exaggerating earlier, they did specifically say that they were entirely out of gold dust earlier. So now they're just super out of gold dust. Also, James just leaves after this. If I were James, I wouldn't go anywhere alone for the next few weeks. You were just the victim of attempted murder. Burnett as a character is so f***ing depressing. He never says one thing that's even moderately happy. He says all of this depressing sh but the first time we see him smile is when he gets his 
fucking train working. Not when you saw your granddaughter for the first time in years. Nope, just when you get your silly little train that you wasted 20 years of your life working on, on a track again. No wonder no one comes to visit you, man. You're a fucking bummer. This is the first time he even hugs Lily when he gets his stupid train working again. I'm starting to get a feeling that he did a lot more than conduct this train when it was actually working. Either way, they get Lady back on the track and she's good as new. Lady even gets her face back, which is cool, but I'm still in the camp of the fact that this would be horrifying to look at in person. Thomas also shows up behind them. No clue how this happened because remember when he fell in that hole like an hour ago? All of our main characters finally meet up in the scene and the conductor tells Junior that if they don't find some gold dust and fast, they'll die. Like they will 100% cease to exist without more gold dust. So are these guys like fairies or something? What exactly is the nature of their existence? But before they can piece together that lady is the key to more gold dust, Diesel comes to ruin their day. And by ruin their day, I mean kill them. Of course I mean kill them, that's, that's, that's all, he's gonna kill them. Diesel has fucking had it and he's gonna do his absolute best to kill Burnett, Lady, and Thomas in that order. Seriously, Diesel terrified me as a kid. Like, like, bro is genuinely scary. After outrunning Diesel for a good while, they go over to this bridge that ends up falling apart under their weight and speed. So when Diesel tries to cross the bridge, he ends up breaking it apart because he's a heavy metal piece of shit, and he's carried away downstream by this impressively buoyant boat. The fact that a diesel engine dropped into this boat and it's just floating along like nothing that is a master class of engineering right there our main characters figure out that they can get more gold dust by mixing water with these gold shavings that were kicked up when lady made her way through the magic railroad i'm not an alchemist but i'm pretty sure that mixing water and metal shavings will just give you wet metal shavings but because this movie isn't bitch made by such things such as physics and chemistry this works and Junior and the Conductor get all the gold dust they could ever need. Some of which Junior ends up giving to Lily. Wait, so did he just give a 12 year old girl the ability to teleport? Maybe if she was smarter, but she ends up giving it to her grandfather who puts it on this stuffed bluebird and gives it a rainbow effect. That'll probably get annoying during the night, but whatever. Someday Lily is going to wake up in a cold sweat and realize that she wasted that shit. The Conductor also decides that Junior has now become ready to be the next Conductor of Sodor. Isn't this the guy who couldn't help himself from hopping on a windmill like an hour and a half ago? He almost got himself and James killed because he wanted to do a couple of spins. He almost let you die in the middle of nowhere because he overslept. This was yesterday! The movie ends with a couple random shots of Shining Time. I I'm not kidding. There's nothing that happens here. I can't write a quippy ending to this video because the movie doesn't have a real ending to it. The movie just happens until it doesn't. Well, you know what they say, never meet your heroes and don't watch live action movie renditions of your favorite childhood toys. Okay, all things said, I didn't hate this movie. There aren't any real reasons to feel strongly one way or another about this film. It's about Thomas the fucking tank engine. That in and of itself is enough to make me suspend my disbelief until it fucking asphyxiates. But I unfortunately can't say that I care a lot for this movie. Starting with the characters, they just kind of aren't great. I don't hate them, but they're as vibrant as vanilla Greek yogurt. And not like the good kind, like, like the Walmart brand that feels like paste in your mouth. The Conductor and Junior are interesting characters, and I think Stone is kind of funny for the wrong reasons. I'd hate to kick him while he's already down, but his depression is so funny to me. That sentence sounds wild out of context, but this is a grown ass man who began to self isolate for two decades because his train stopped working. Like, come on, that's pretty fing crazy, right? This guy genuinely should have been medicated. Like, like, I got some Zoloft I can let you borrow if you need it, man. The child characters are both not fun, and the other lady who I already forgot the name of is Mid. The trains are cool, but they're not really characters as much as they are some kid playing with a toy set. Like, their personalities are ripped straight from the comics and cartoons and whatever the hell else Mattel licensed in the last 80 years. But like, it makes sense that the trains don't get much character development. They're fucking trains. But as a movie, I gotta judge them as characters and they just don't do much. I will say I did really like the sets for this movie. I, I really enjoy how it feels like a giant toy set. 
So props for that. The music is also surprisingly good. I mean, anything with lyrics that they made for this movie is pretty much tinnitus on repeat. But other than that, I like the original score for this film. The choice to not animate the faceplates of this movie makes it feel somewhat lifeless. Once again, I think that if they did do it, it would probably look weird. So I understand the choice not to, but it leaves a lot of weight on the shoulders of the voice actors. So they all sound like they're overexerting themselves to give a performance that gives any life and personality to the trains. Other than the Diesels and Gordon, who only has like four lines by the way, none of the voice actors are really worth writing home about. So coming to a conclusion, I'm gonna give Thomas and the Magic Railroad a five out of 10 on the critical score. It's not great, but at the same time, it doesn't need to be. I enjoyed it for what it is, but it's still a mediocre movie. On the fun score, I'll probably give it like a six and a half if you like Thomas. It's not like the most enjoyable movie ever, but as someone who grew up with the film, I can't help but enjoy it. Anyway, thank you guys for watching the video. If you made it all the way to the end, leave a like, because I would assume you liked it, and maybe consider subscribing. Hit that, hit that like button, punch it in the face, beat it to death, you know. Um, thank you to my wonderful patrons. You guys are all really awesome. My last few videos didn't do so hot, so I appreciate having you guys to help me out through this month. Um, speaking of which, the reason my videos aren't doing so hot, two major reasons. One, it says returning viewers aren't choosing to watch the video, which two, is making YouTube not push my content to new viewers. Here is the actual chart of the new viewers I've gotten this month. It's like, I think it's like a thousand new viewers. So if you guys wouldn't mind sharing the content, that would help me out a lot if you don't want to. That's cool. I will just try to make my, my content the best it can be but I would always appreciate any help. Anyway, I gotta hurry out of here because my scheduled bear fighting appointment is supposed to start soon. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Seriously, guys, uh, help me out. I don't know how I got myself in this situation again. I barely made it out last time. Please, somebody put an end to this.